Good morning, everybody. This is Mr. Raider. It is March 18th, 2020. This is the first trial run of remote-based learning. Uh, what I'm going to have you all look at today is a uh, sample data analysis paper written by two of your classmates. We're going to think through the revision process. I want to make sure that these three days are as uh, productive as they can possibly be for you all while you're at home. So if you look at the PowerPoint screen in front of you, the aim for the next couple of days is to kind of consider to what extent did you answer your field research question in your data analysis paper. So the first thing that you should do once you finish listening to this video is to take a look at your survey appendix. It should be appendix B. Look at what that field research question is. And first C, was it measuring a knowledge, something related to awareness in New York City? Was it relating to behaviors, people's habits, the things that people are doing? Or was it really measured more to how they felt or what they believed about something, looking at an attitude? So if you look at this work over the next three days, we're gonna be looking at revising the research and analysis papers based on the comments that I provided to you or based on the sample one that we're gonna look over together. Uh, so that you can turn it in, and then also to consider part A of the recommendation. Uh, the next video that you will see will be on Monday, March 23rd, when the city officially uh, begins its remote learning process. You should have received uh, letters in the mail from our principal, Ms. Shepard, and in addition, you should also be receiving emails with information and surveys and forms. Please make sure that you fill them out as soon as you possibly can. So what I want to do next is show you this sample pivot table created from a former student and to kind of just think about how we identify important statistical findings in these pivot tables. So if you look at the appendix title, it is comparing the neighborhood uh, a person lives in and their personal satisfaction with the local subway station. So we're looking at a very clear demographic with a very clear attitudinal question. Uh, the quality of life topic was looking at the subway stations themselves, specifically at uh, people's opinions about them. So if we look on the top row, it is the attitude question, the satisfaction with the cleanliness of the local subway station, ranked from negative to positive, very unsatisfied to very satisfied. And then the neighborhoods are all Brooklyn neighborhoods, Bay Ridge, Sunset Park, Park Slope, Fort Greene, and Bedford-Stuyvesant. And we can see the total surveys given under the grand total, 201. This tells us that this is most likely a partnership. And the correlation factor between the neighborhood a person lived in and their satisfaction with their local subway station. Uh, so there's three different levels when we do data analysis. The first level is to consider the correlation number. Correlations range in value from negative one to positive one. Any number that is close to either positive one or negative one is considered uh, strongly correlated, which essentially means that if it was positively correlated as one number moves to the right or goes up, the other one also goes up. And if it's negative, it's the opposite. As one goes down, the other one also goes down. If the number is very close to zero, it means that it is a very weak correlation. It means that something else maybe a different demographic or a different behavior might be better influencing people's opinions. So with that in mind, if we look at this number, it's 0 0.28. Now 0 0.28 is closer to zero than it is to 0.5, which would indicate a moderate correlation. Therefore, level one analysis tells me that these two variables are related. There is a connection, but it's moderately weak. There might be something else other than the neighborhood that the person lived in. The underlying assumption may have been the subway stations are better maintained in one neighborhood as opposed to another. So let's take a look at the actual data itself. So the first thing you should do is look at the numbers that pop out in terms of highs and lows. So the first number that pops out immediately is the very satisfied column here. As you can see, there are a grand total of six out of 201 survey respondents which is a rather low number. It actually ends up being 2.98% as I put the number into my calculator. So very, very low. Now, if I wanted to see how many people were at least satisfied, I would add 69 and six. That would give me 75. 75 divided by 201 would be 37.3%. So if I look at that number, it seems that yes, we still have another uh, 
53% or so that are not sat that are not satisfied, but it is not as uh, strong as, as the six. Likewise, I can add 54 and 72, which is the unsatisfied, very unsatisfied, and I get 126. When I divide that by 201, I get 62.69%. Note that I'm rounding to the nearest hundredths place. When you do your data analysis, you should do it that way. And that would tell us then at least two out of every three people, if not seven out of every 10 people, are unsatisfied regardless of their neighborhoods. And that is another level of data analysis that you can talk about in writing. So what I'm gonna ask you to do uh, for the next three days is to look back at your data analysis section of your papers. Specifically, look at the comments that I wrote in terms of Appendix B, which will be your survey, considering which pivot tables you made, and if those specific pivot tables are really getting at the heart of your field research question, or if they're simply not. Uh, create new pivot tables if it was suggested, or review the comments and the data carefully to see if you missed anything notable in the pivot tables themselves. This will allow you to have stronger data for your recommendation, which will allow you to do a better job writing part A of your recommendation, specifically uh, the fourth paragraph where you have to talk about the feasibility of your papers. What I would like to do now is move into a sample paper. This was written by two of your classmates, and I thought it was a really, really good paper, so I'd like to share it with you all. And just to give you some insight into how I was thinking about revisions when I was going through some of the papers. So if you look at the introductory paragraph, as Z1 and Kevin do, they provide some context about their quality of life issues, specifically looking at uh, the lack of professional translation services in hospitals and other medical facilities. Um, if we look at the first set of comments, the two of them actually created, and you'll see this in their appendix, the survey in three different languages. That's one of their strengths. That's one of their assets. The two students know how to speak uh, three languages between them. So they should mention in their introduction that they created their survey in English, Spanish, and Mandarin to really reach out to those three populations. If we look at the second paragraph, I want to just point out how they looked at their numbers. They specifically went to the New York City Population Fact Finder, included the citation to discuss the people that they serve it. They were able to use this to calculate the margin of error using the confidence interval calculator. And they also mentioned how many of their respondents had limited English proficiency and included the citation to the letter of their relevant appendix. Uh, one of the recommendations I actually have for every student, including these two, is to be sure that when you do the revisions that you're writing in the past tense, this is something that you have already done. So be mindful of that. If you notice are or is, switch it to were and did. These are the kinds of English grammatical features you want to include as you're writing your paper. Okay, when I go into the third paragraph, it discusses where they went, how many surveys they gave out, and who they surveyed. The only comment that I really put in their paper is to kind of think about how to convey to the reader that since their survey method was really purposive, they were looking to only give this to uh, immigrants living in the, in the five boroughs, that they need to be able to call out how they were able to figure out who was an immigrant when they did their surveying process. When we look at the fourth paragraph, this is the beginning of their field research in terms of the data. So I'm just gonna read this opening sentence. They wrote, to better understand how our field research helped answer our initial question concerning immigrant awareness on translation services, we decided to create descriptive tables, charts, and pivot tables to further analyze the meaning behind our data. What I like about that is they're very clear to the reader in terms of what it is that they did to organize their data analysis. Remember at the end of the day, when we eventually submit this to the Wise Foundation, and I'm thinking right now it might be more May or June than April 23rd, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. The more clear you can be to your audience, the better they will be able to understand the points you're trying to make. Uh, I've seen students include their charts uh, one after the other in terms of a vertical alignment. These two chose a horizontal alignment, which is fine with me. 
What I do like is that both of them, they do reference not just the figure number, but the relevant letters in their appendices that has the data so we can get a bigger picture in terms of what it is that they did. As you can see, I did not necessarily give them a lot of additional comments and feedback. It's because they did a really nice job with their data analysis. Uh, point out several things. Notice they're talking about percentages and numbers. They're including both and they're referencing the appendix letters. It's very useful. Uh, notice they're not using words like proves. They're using words like suggests. They're not saying that they are lacking knowledge. They might be lacking knowledge. Therefore, they're being more clear in terms of how they can interpret their results. Uh, comment here, this is really more for their recommendation, but one of the things that I had suggested to the two of them was to consider maybe interviewing at this point over the telephone if possible. It may not be uh, at this moment, probably won't be uh, given the COVID outbreak, but really it'd be local hospital workers and officials who would actually be able to kind of comment on how well the translation services are actually going for people in their neighborhoods. And also to reach out to a local council member to see what are some regulations that are taking places in hospitals, in primary care physician offices, so on and so forth. Their third figure that they included was a pivot table. You'll note that they did change around the format and the layout. Uh, we'll point out here, this is clearly an example of them merging their columns. So if I wanted to merge, I would just highlight, right click, and click on merge cells. And that's how you would merge the two. I'm gonna undo it, because I don't actually wanna do that in their paper, but that's what they did. The whole point is to try to make the table as visually appealing as possible. For most of the papers that I read, I wrote at the end of the essays, see appendices for further comments. That was my opportunity to then give additional feedback in terms of the work that I saw. As you can see, these two did a really nice job on their paper and their grade clearly reflects it. They included their references from their background paper in this as well. And you'll eventually wanna do that when you put together your final proposal. This is their letter to their expert, their responses from their expert. This is their surveys. Notice the field research question. It's a knowledge, it's really looking at knowledge. They ask how aware are immigrants in New York City regarding their rights for adequate translation services. So when thinking about which variables to compare, it would make a lot of sense to compare demographic with knowledge, attitudes with knowledge and behaviors with knowledge. As you can see, they have the survey in English, Spanish, and Chinese. This is the appendices in terms of what it should look like. So you always have the question, the table, and the chart. Notice how the chart has slice labels with actual data points that makes a difference. Again, question, table, chart. Now, if you look at my first comment here, I wrote, this would be a good question to present in the data and compare with question 13. Question three speaks to a demographic. What is a person's English proficiency? I'm gonna go back to the survey. Question 13, my family member or I struggle to communicate with their healthcare provider. So it would really be looking at a demographic, specifically then with an attitude as it relates to experiences with translation services in hospitals and other medical settings. And again, you'll see every single question is the same format. This makes it very clear to the audience in terms of what the question was, in terms of the data that was collected, and in terms of the results that were then discussed in the paper. Every single letter, for example, I saw Appendix O in their data analysis paper, I can go right back to the appendix and see exactly what they were going with. And you can clearly see that the two students gave uh, additional analysis of that uh, data. Notice the paper more or less ends here, survey question 14. We have the pivot table one and pivot table two. The remaining appendices, so this would be the website and this would be the petition, would come about when looking at the recommendation. 
So to look at the summary slide is to really consider what changes we can make in the data analysis paragraphs. Consider the pivot tables, the three levels of analysis. Remember level one, look simply at the correlation number. If it is close to zero, it means it's very weak. The variables are not really related. There must be something else involved. Level two, looking at the pivot table itself for highs and lows, what numbers stand out the most and why. And then level three, adding different numbers in the table to find out how many people are at least satisfied, how many of you are at least not satisfied, whatever it is that you might be asking. In the conclusion, keep in mind for the data analysis paper, you should discuss how your data will enhance your recommendation. Right? And that should cover everything. I want to thank you for uh, listening, for taking notes. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Send me an email, and I will be glad to help you out over the next several days. I will post another lesson on Monday morning. We're going to look at how to design uh, websites on Weebly, and you'll have the opportunity to either create a website on Weebly, on Wix, or on GitHub. I hope everybody has a good day. Stay safe, practice social distancing, and get fresh air. Have a good day.